Hello, everyone. Welcome and to the session today. Um, my name is Krista Muzak, and I'm with my colleague here, Eric Wilson. Today Good we're afternoon, going to... everyone. Yeah. Eric, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Absolutely, yeah. Good morning, afternoon, evening, or wherever you're located in the world. Uh, my name is Eric Wilson, and I oversee the Corporate Compliance, Global Compliance Program for Homework and Pain. We are an oil and gas contract drilling company. We're an international company. Our global headquarters is in Oklahoma, but we have offices in Texas, Colorado, Pennsylvania, North Dakota, as well as offices in India, Argentina, Colombia, Scotland, France, and India in the Middle East. Um, I'm been doing compliance for 15 years now. Uh, Kristen, I met about 11 years ago at a compliance conference, and we've just become uh, great colleagues, and we correspond together. We ask each other things, challenges that we're facing at each other's organizations. And back in 2014, she actually worked for me for a couple of years, and she helped me lead our program on fo that focuses on anti-corruption and trade compliance, and now it's into the data privacy world. I'll turn it over to you now, Krista. Thanks, Eric. Hello, everybody. Um, as Eric said, I'm Krista Muzak. I currently work in the risk management and compliance area for Johnson & Johnson in Tampa, Florida. Um, I did work with Eric for a little while, a few years ago, and it was really wonderful. My uh, current role currently includes oversight and compliance with SOX controls, but in the past, I've enjoyed roles in policy, training, communication programs, anti-corruption, as Eric mentioned, and enterprise risk management. Creating and maintaining a culture of compliance and ethics is my top priority in all of the positions that I've held. As Eric mentioned, we met over 10 years ago, and this specific topic of employee engagement and integration and success has been one that we've returned to again and again over the time that we've known each other, partially because it's a bit of a moving target in terms of how the workplace has changed as well as technology and methods of communication have changed. Uh, we're both excited to be a part of the virtual conference, the 2022 impact and the fantastic lineup of speakers and sessions. As the last session for today, we have a lot of great information to cover. Before we get started, I do need to state that the information Eric and I are both sharing are our own and neither of us are representatives or spokespersons of our company. So without further ado, let's dive in. Eric and I had a lot of fun putting this session together for you today, and I'm calling it your session because the hope is that while Eric and I share the experiences that we've encountered, we hope that you'll also share yours. Please feel free to ask questions, pose your own struggles and experiences, and together we can crowdsource solutions. The slides we've put together are to cover our main points and are primarily to guide conversation. They will be available after our session. Now, we all have struggles in getting the word out about our compliance program. So today, let's also crack open some of the strategies to advance the program beyond headquarters, beyond the corporate walls. Once we see success, the next question is, how do we keep that momentum? How do we stay connected? Now, as mentioned earlier, this topic is something that Eric and I and our network of compliance colleagues have discussed many times. We know that it's not unique to us and based on our prior companies that we've worked for, it's not unique to just any one industry. So today, Eric and I are going to bring these objectives and I'm confident we'll all walk away with new ideas. So to our last objective showing here, Eric and I will start the conversation today. And after this week of impact, we will have more colleagues in our network to collaborate with and to keep the ball rolling. So again, please use the chat feature to submit your questions, comments, ideas. We all wanna hear from you. And I'm sure you all wanna share your great ideas, struggles, let's help each other out in today's session. So let's get going. I'm gonna turn this over to Eric to start with some compliance concerns, some of the things that keep us up at night. All right, thanks Krista for sharing all that. So as I mentioned earlier, the organization I work for, we have a, our corporate compliance group sits in Oklahoma, but we have offices all over the world and employees all over the world. 
you know, how, how, how do we make sure they're abiding by our policies and procedures that we've educated on them once they're in their new hire orientation? How do we maintain compliance being on the forefront of their minds as their, you know, employment cycle with the company continues for years and years to come, hopefully? So some of the compliance concerns I've had and I deal with on a daily basis and make, you know, that's on the back of my mind and keeps me up is one item is trade compliance. We have sales, global sales reps all over the world. When they're looking for new work, when they're doing things, are they keeping in mind the sanctions regimes of where we operate in the U.S. and U.K., et cetera, and where and who we can and cannot do business with? Are they remembering that we cannot conduct business with certain entities in Russia right now, given the sanctions? Can we do work in Iran or Venezuela as an oil and gas company, are they keeping that in mind? You know, my group also reviews all of our shipments that leave the U.S. and shipments that are uh, going from one country to another country or deemed exports. Are they keeping in mind to make sure my group is looped in to get approval to ship something to make sure it's classified correctly for BIS and we can even ship that part without a license? Another area that we've had to deal with lately and keeps me up is new employees to the organization through M&A activity. You know, they're old world, they didn't really have to consider this, but are they considering these things I just mentioned? Another area that kind of keeps me up at night that always, um, that I want to make sure they're always on the front part of the mind is hospitality and entertainment related to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or other anti-corruption laws. Over the past few years, there have been lots of um, investigations and closure on cases due to hospitality events. A couple of Novartis paid roughly $345 million to resolve issues related to bribing officials with hospitality and entertainment for work. One of the bigger ones, of all, one of the highest ones of all time was Airbus, $4 billion in fines, and one of their issues was related to gifts and entertainment or hospitality and entertainment to secure work. So are, are the employees that are all over the world entertaining or meeting with customers, it doesn't even have to be government entities under the UK Bribery Act, it's private briberies outlawed. Are they abiding by our policy of mill limitations? Are they documenting things correctly? That's what keeps me up at night. One of the bigger areas as well is in uh, for our guys who work on our oil rigs in the U.S., um, are they abiding by the policy with regards to discrimination and harassment? Are they treating everyone equitably in the right way? Are they looking at people for their value and who they are and not discriminating against them? That's what keeps me up at night, just due to recent EEOCs throughout the year, uh, claims through the EEOC. Last year, I think there were 61,000 cases roughly $950 million in fines and penalties and settlements. You know, and of those cases, 34% were related to race, 30% to sex, and 10% to national origin. So are people doing the right thing with each other out there on our rigs where we can't main, stay on top of them to remind them, you can't say this, treat people fairly. We, we just can't be there. So that's what kind of keeps me up in mind. Are people reporting it? The final thing that kind of keeps me up at night before I turn it over to Krista is the compliance mindset of people. My industry is highly dangerous with guys working on the oil rigs, pulling slips, putting pipe in the ground, and safety is always on the forefront of their mind. Do they see something unsafe to keep their uh, coworkers safe from getting injured? Of course they do. How do we ingrain that mindset of compliance into that same methodology in their mind? If something doesn't look right in regards to a transaction, or an individual or something, are they stopping the process and bringing compliance or legal in for advice? So those are the four top compliance concerns I have on a daily basis right now. Krista, how about you? What are some of yours? Yeah, and actually before I get started, I wanna comment because Eric, when you were just talking about mergers and acquisitions, um, I know you were mentioning it in relation to trade compliance laws, but I right. think that, I think that um, a lot of people may have this experience is that when, um, especially if somebody's coming from maybe a less regulated environment, whether it because of the country they were in or the way that their business was working, 
they come into your fold where you're um, much more, you know, much more of a mm-hmm. com- uh, strong control environment, compliance mindset, that sort of thing. It's very difficult because sometimes you'll hear um, you'll hear people say from who have been part of a merger or ca- came in from an acquisition, right. this isn't this isn't how we did it. We used to be able to take anybody out to dinner whenever we wanted to and buy all the booze and food we wanted to. And it's like, well, okay, yes, that may have been the situation you were in, but this is, this is our compliance environment now. And this is, this is what you need to, you need to acclimate to, to these new rules. And I definitely think that that's for sure a struggle um, in terms of, um, in terms of trying to like get people to come out of what they had been in and learn to embrace a new situation, a new compliance environment. Exactly. Yeah, I, we, you know, in 2017, 18, and 19, we did five acquisitions over that time. And each time the challenge was a little different to keep those employees engaged with the program from the onset and buy it into it to where I am five, six years later already, just making sure they're never forgetting this and that they are just part of a larger organization. This is how we have to be. And some of it's just been sitting down talking to them that will explain some of the tools I think work for me to get them to buy into that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly the, like why this whole session came to be is because it's just, you know, there's, there's brand new people new to your company for whatever reason, um, new to the roles and they're coming in and you're just, and you're trying to engage with these new employees and then trying to keep it where it's, it's not just a once and done. It's (laughs) ongoing, that relationship building, that, staying in the staying in top, compliance and top of mind which really is what like when you were talking about compliance mindset it's where people organically think to themselves what do i do every single day to protect the company right. um, what am i doing to protect my fellow colleagues like in the ehs world that you were just talking about and you know what do i do every single day to actively maintain that strong control environment right <clears throat> excuse me yeah so it's not just it's not just taking annual code training and then no one thinks about compliance until the next year. You know, you really want to, I mean, our, it's a little bit of an uphill battle for us as compliance professionals in certain circumstances, especially with, you know, now with remote, but prior to the right. pandemic, just the people who are outside of those corporate walls, as we were saying. Yeah, um, Krista, we started this discussion when everyone was in the office and build offices. And now this has just morphed into how do we keep our employees who are working remotely engaged since we don't see them all the time, even if they're out of their corporate office locations. So for me, like Tulsa, Oklahoma. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, um, so going back to the slide, um, one of the things too, is just trying to figure out how to, with limited budget, how do we prove that com- again, still just keeping that. And it, it, it may have to do with the maturity of the compliance program at a company anyway. So like Eric, you have a really mature program. And um, I know further into the session today, we're going to talk a little bit about how you have um, some resources where you can you can uh, continue to build your program. Some some of the folks on the line might not have um, as many resources, or they're still in the development phase. So it's trying to figure out how how do we how do we make show compliance as a value proposition, not just overhead. Uh, I found a quick Google search. I was finding. Um, the Competitive Enterprise Institute said that companies reported an average to maintain compliance can be upwards of $10,000 per employee. So that's a lot of overhead if you're in a large company. So you have to show, you know, how do you, how do you explain or how do you create the story where you're saying, yes, that's expensive, but fines and penalties are, are way more. And instead, what you can save on fines and penalties by having a strong compliance department and um, working towards mature de- department, uh, you can use those for capital expenses or improvements, that sort of thing. Um, one of the other things ta- that that's a concern in terms, just generally, but also in terms of employee engagement, is the is the compliance footprint that we have. So on the global or macro level, there's the expansion through mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, emerging markets. Um, other growth that keep that will keep compliance professionals on their toes, um, but even on the micro level, you could be expanding into another state, province, or region, um, or you um, or just other challenges and concerns that might keep you up at night. I know the for anybody that is on with us right now who are on with um, 
conversant in Kroger, even though the woman from Kroger is only in the United States, her, their, um, their horizontal market is massive and so diverse. So their, her compliance, uh, Martha, um, Martha Sarah from Kroger, her compliance footprint goes this way and just stays in the United States, as opposed to Eric, you just listed a, a ton of other countries that, you know, you started in Tulsa and then you just branched out. So it's a lot of things that'll, you know, it's a concern. It keeps, um, you know, it might keep you up at night. Um, one of the things too, that I have it as a concern because it's sometimes not as easy as uh, me personally, as I would like it to be that becoming like being seen as a partner, the relationships between compliance and business. So you want to be viewed as a person, not just a person or a function that's asking the business to do something, you know, do this training, do this, do that. But instead you want it to be more of a symbiotic relationship and where you're more of a partner. So building the relationship where you offer, we come in, um, you know, second line of defense, we're coming in saying, what can I do to help you? What can I do to help your team do their job best? What guidance can we provide? Because ultimately, when we help uh, the business area be successful compliantly, we also, you know, ultimately there's money, there could be money saved because then we're not in, you know, we're again, back to the saving, you know, penalties and fines and that sort of thing. Um, and then just generally today, uh, our whole topic is on employee engagement. Uh, the solution for many of our concerns mm -hmm. that we just listed lie with engagement, which is why we're here today. Um, so just thinking about showing ourselves their value, being seen as a partner, embedding that compliance mindset. Um, as a prior manager that Eric and I had had a few handful of years ago, he's retired now, but he used to always say, we need to reach the hearts and the minds of the company. We need to be able to, to get people to, to buy into it, not just on paper, but they, we need them to actually you know, want to be a part of a compliant environment. So, and then finally, after all of these, and, and I don't know, Eric, if there's been any, anybody else has, has listed any of their concerns, there's a, no. we can talk about specific struggles later too, but ultimately showing your value need to be able to measure success you need to what does success look like first right. of all um, when you measure it in a meaningful way that properly reflect reflects your effort the highs and the lows it's going to be uh, maybe areas of improvement improvement for the compliance team as well as compliance uh, improvement for the people that we're working with in the business that we're helping um, and then we can see too are you measuring success will also illustrate is the program effective um, gauging, are, you know, are you successful against the strategy that you've, that you've created for your program? Um, are you continuously monitoring? You can use scorecards, health checks, um, mm -hmm. and obviously, you know, starting with SMART goals is the best way, you know, um, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, I don't know about anyone on the phone, Eric, I, there's, I do see a lot where people will ask uh, ask for something to be done and then never give the deadline or either give a ridiculously short deadline or one that's so far down the line, you wonder how it's even going to end up being relevant in the first place. But, <laughs> but, you know, but, but starting with, but it's making it smart, making those smart goals and having it time bound. So it's, so it's relative and it's reliable. Um, that's, that's going to build into the measurement of success. Right. Krista, we did get a question. Sure. Someone asked, do we have specific metrics that we think are essential to show, measure success? And I'm not sure who asked that, but yes, we do have some examples of what we believe are that work is some specific metrics that we'll get to in a few minutes, but th thanks for asking that question. Yeah. And Krista, I just wanna you know, say something that you mentioned earlier, like you talked about like the cost to run a compliance group. Well. We are just a GNA cost. So how do we need to think about mm -hmm. how we speak to the employees in the organization that we are a we're not just a profit uh, a GNA center for the company. Like we do provide some sort of dollar value, even though it's indirect dollar value. Like 
I, I joke with my CCO and others in the organization that the group, the compliance group is uh, a, a revenue keeping department. We're not generating, but we help keep the revenue by monitoring what's going on in the organization to ensure we do have the dollars to spend. So it's also spinning what your group does to the employees so they stay engaged and they just don't see it as a cost to them. Yeah, yeah, I like that revenue keeping or retaining. That's excellent. Yeah, yeah, I, I call it the revenue, uh, it's innovative revenue keeping organization or something goofy <laughs> like that. Does that, smell, does that smell something? No, no, no it doesn't. Um, yeah, but we can, let's move on to the next slide. But in, re, in response also to the question that came up, um, Eric and I are going to give you very, we're going to give you information about measuring success based on what we've done. Um, right. I do encourage everybody, please feel free to, I really do. This would, you know, I wish, I almost wish we could just take everybody off of off the microphone and we can just like generate ideas because part of the thing is um, the person who posed the question, what they're asking or, or what they're doing when they leave this session may be, uh, they may have a different approach. So our, what we cover in a couple of minutes um, on, the next, on the next couple of slides may, may not be the right thing. So I definitely encourage the, the rest of the audience, if you wanna share um, some, of the, some of the key metrics that you currently use, then also too, we can all build this together. Um, Eric and I definitely appreciate the opportunity that we're here to present all right. this information to you, but, but we also recognize that we haven't, we haven't done everything. But, so right. we and don't we, we don't know and we face challenges too so someone else on this presentation or this call might have an idea that we no one else had even thought of or we haven't thought of so right. we're just looking for best ways to be able to report things and engage the audience we, yep. we've yep. been doing chris and i've been doing this for a lot of years and in a lot of discussions and things seem, we've had some success but others may be doing something differently that we all can build off of yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks, Eric. Good point. So taking a look at engagement, um, considering the concerns that we just discussed and any others um, that we might come up with in chat in a little bit, um, there's plenty of things to keep us up at night. So policies, regulatory changes, business expansions, and the list goes on. But in each of these scenarios, there's an opportunity to engage with the stakeholders to show our value and to help instill that compliance mindset that we just talked about. So in our experience, um, we've seen our stakeholders or our audience change through new hires, um, people who are new to the company, new to, um, new to the company through mergers or acquisitions, that sort of thing, colleagues who are remote to headquarters, and whether it be that they're in the field at a rig site, a warehouse, or just because of the pandemic working remotely. So there's a lot of opportunity for those who are new to the role, people who are now in charge of the compliance activities in their team and the expense reports, the tone of the, tone of the teams, continuing that culture of compliance, um, or just bringing a more compliant framework to the new team. And all of these changes are opportunities for the compliance team to engage, train, guide, advise, and partner to build that team of allies. So Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you about engagement struggles. Yeah, so we talked about the different functions of compliance and concerns. Chris had just shared who we're trying to reach with our engagement audience. I'm just going to share some of the struggles that Chris and I have discussed over the years. And again, feel free to chime in in the chat if there, we're missing something or there's other things you're facing. So maybe I can ask the question and someone else might have an answer. So some of the engagement struggles is those outside the corporate walls. Like I mentioned earlier, initially this, this we started, Chris and I discussed, how do we reach our people in our field offices outside of the corporate office? But now that applies to all of those working remotely in today's landscape. How do we keep them involved with what's going on in the world? What's useful, meaningful, but not too cutesy? You know, we, we don't wanna use all the common frames, but what's useful to them to keep them engaged and remind them ongoing what's going on. You know, I, I say, just mentioned, oh, I was, ahead, I'm sorry, if I could, about the not too cutesy and the, um, there's a lot of, um, 
there's okay. a lot of information about reaching millennials. And I, uh, I'm a Gen Xer, but I identify as a millennial, but I also, I still struggle with like, what's, you know, what's too cutesy, what's like, like it's funny, but it's not really funny because it's, you have to consider. And um, I would definitely say that no one has ever accused a compliance person of being funny, but it's, um, but it's, but it is one of those things like, like, how do you, how do you reach the audience? And sometimes you have to, you have to move outside of what your, how you view yourself as a compliance professional, because it's not about you. It's about your message and it's about the people you want to come up with something that, that the audience is willing to receive or, or, you know, so, so it's a, it's a fine line. The, the useful, but not too cutesy is a, is a tough one. It's a tough one right. for me. I don't know if you've struggled with that because maybe you're, you have a pretty diverse um, workforce. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to be, you know, that's a, an engagement struggle. I'll mention here in a minute, but just the cultural differences in the organization, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can maybe put out a posting or a memo on our internal website but it might not drive home what we're trying to drive home just because it's not received or, you know, in this year's training that we're doing for anti-corruption, I made a reference to the TV series um, office, mm -hmm. but I thought it was hilarious because I knew what it meant, but I had feedback that it probably wouldn't go over well in the other countries because they didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's one of the struggles. I think what you were referring to, Mm -hmm. You know, there's remote workers and I mentioned that, like I said, you know, I have employed, there's com employees within my organization that are transferred to international from U.S. land and back and forth and their compliance requirements and training have changed as the legal landscape has changed in regards to like data privacy and other laws that are popping up all over the world. How do we train properly on those? What's the right method? Is it the HR system? How long does it need to be? Is it mindful to them? Mm -hmm. You know, identifying the right people for targeted trainings. That's a struggle I have. Of am I making sure I'm pulling in the right people for these topics, such as anti-corruption? So am I getting all the salespeople right? Am I getting all the supply chain people right? Do I base it off business title versus category large swaths? So it's tailoring that training. That's just an engagement struggle to make sure it's not a it's we're hitting the right target but it's also not the boring powerpoint trainings that we've all seen like how is it engaging how does it stick with them how do you find the right messaging avenues with the funny videos or mm -hmm. the you know the whatever we need to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. another challenge my group my company has and christian has this as well um language barriers and translation costs my i'm in h and p's in five different you know, multiple countries, five different languages. Krista informed me they're in 78 different countries. So how, how I mean, as organization. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and I mean, at a prior, I'm, at a prior company, we had 17 languages that we had to translate it to. And that's really right. expensive. When you do the code, all of your policies, everything, it's very, very different, difficult. Plus then just the communications you might want to send out, you know, digital signage, just table mm -hmm. toppers, like everything. It's just so, um, Right, and, and, you, tough and, you, and you can't use Google Translate for all that. So how, how do you find that right balance of we're going to spend money here versus there to make sure we pull people in? Okay. On cultural differences is a struggle. You know, holidays are different in all these countries. Yeah. So global versus U.S. You know, how, how, as Chris just said, how do we reach the hearts and minds of people when that phrase might not mean anything to them? So how do we make it to where it's meaningful to everyone else? And the other part too about the, the cultural, I mean, so there's, there's culture, cultural differences, but then there's just the geographic culture differences, right. such, such as, so for me, my team, uh, half of my team was out on Friday, Thursday, Friday, and Monday for the Easter holiday. Um, I, I worked all three of those days, which is fine. But if from an engagement perspective, what if you wanted to, if there was something really important that was happening, I, uh, there's huge pockets of our employee base that we would have been unable to reach those three days. Now, there's several other days, obviously, in the month that we can pick from. But part of it is um, just making sure that messaging comes out on the right time so people can consume it. People are, you know, taking it in. It's not, um, you know, I probably would wait till after the holiday 
rather right. than try to send something important right before people are gone for five days. And you were mentioning, Eric, about traveling, um, uh, not traveling during Ramadan just, right. yeah. just now, right? Yeah, and we did get a question. So, Krista, I'm going to pose it, let you think about it, and I'll okay. talk and then come back to it. Okay. Do we struggle with policies based on the different laws in the different countries we operate in? So we'll come back to that here in a minute. Um, yeah, an example of cult recognizing cultural differences when delivering training or traveling to build relationships with people. Um, I face this well, we have offices in the uh, Abu Dhabi and Bahrain, and we hadn't been over there in the last couple of years due to the pandemic, and we needed to get over there and, you know, just meet with them in person again. Well, I wanted to go in April just because we hadn't been there. And before it starts getting too hot over in that area of the world, I was being somewhat selfish of like, I want to get over there when it's decent weather. Mm -hmm. Well, I was looking at their calendar and this month over in the Middle East, it's Ramadan, their really annual religious holiday. And I, I made the call to go. They said we can come, but it just wouldn't be as engaging to them or as meaningful necessarily mm -hmm. because they were, would be focusing on other things due to the holiday. And I just made the decision for my group and I that we would cancel it and postpone until May because they would be more involved and engaged. So we need to recognize, we had to recognize the holidays that they may, you know, follow versus what we do here. And, you know, ultimately what came out of that, we're going out the end of the May. I miss my Memorial Day holiday in the States, but it's worth it because I get to see them and build relationships with them. Mm -hmm. The last struggle before we get to that question is th there's a new point of contact that comes with bag uh, with baggage or a bad reputation. It, you know, Chris and I, that boss that Chris and I used to work for, he used to always share, don't, you know, be careful of this person, be careful of that person, they'll burn you every time. Well, Chris and I had to break that bias of what he was saying, because he may have just not gotten along with that person to be able to build our relationship, to get that person to engage with us and buy into what we're doing. So that's just a struggle you hear through the room when we're all uh, people with baggage or that have done things in the bad way or issues in the past. We just got to get over it and build that conversation and history with ourselves, with that individual. But that's just a struggle too, just to make sure you're not penalizing someone for some something someone else may have said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes, Chris and I both struggle with policies based on the different laws in the different countries. Mm -hmm. It's hard to stay on top of all of them. It's hard to understand what, can, in my case, what we can issue as a global policy, such as anti-corruption and trade compliance versus employment policies, what we have to have in the U.S. and what needs to be location-centric based off what's required in that law. Chris, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, um, I totally understood the question a different way. And I was thinking it was terms of um, translation because or, or trying to find one policy to rule them all. Because when you posed the question, immediately what came to my mind was um, uh, like uh, for, for um, gifts and entertainment at a prior company for the policy for gifts and entertainment, it was... Um, that you know, and tied to anti-bribery, of course, but it was it was the part about um, that you had the uh, a certain dollar amount. You couldn't give you couldn't give a gift over nominal, and then in the U.S., nominal was set at a certain dollar amount. But then that conversion of USD to any one currency in another country could have been uh, significantly more and exceeding what would be considered nominal. So, so there was, uh, you know, so then we were just like, okay, well, we can't, we don't want to create separate little, separate little ones. So of course, you know, you throw in the comment of like, it's this amount us converting it. I think we converted it to Euro and then, uh, that was the standard. And then, and then the final sentence said, um, or, uh, in line with local currency, so it was it was a way to keep it as one policy with a, the just just the right wording to um, to keep it in in an, in line with each other it, for each country to stay in line with with the nominal dollar amount as set by wow. USD and euro. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> can you reread the question again? Because I felt like there was another. Um, 
do you I, struggle with policies based on the different laws in different countries? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think you got it right then. <laughs> There's another question. I see a I see a five in there too. I yeah. see another one. But um, let's see. I'm gonna while you're taking a look at that, I'm just gonna pop over to um, to the next the slide. connection campaign, right? Yeah, and that's you actually. Yep. So how do we stay connected and um, throughout the organ throughout an employee's life cycle through your life cycle and compliance and just keeping people engaged mm -hmm. um, you know now the pandemic's around you just can't stop and check on people after the new hire orientation what i used to do is i would part of the organization's new hire training for corporate offices i'd sit in and welcome to the company but i would always be diligent and purposeful to go find them at their desk two weeks four weeks six weeks into their uh, employment with the organization just to check on them so that that's something that I diligently did to do it but now you have to use IM method or teams or zoom to do that so it's a little more difficult but you it can still be done if you're doing it purposefully to find people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know some of the other strategies is like we said be culturally sensitive be aware of what's on the time it is when you're asking questions and when you're trying to meet people Mm -hmm. change your you know we, we we have to look at what we're doing for our trainings if they're out of the U.S. and meetings out of the U.S. to for it to be odd times for us because it's important to them that like in India we're meeting with our office tomorrow at 6 a.m. Tulsa time that's five o'clock their time I believe or 5 30 so you know how, how do we make sure we we move to their time and not everything being on corporate time Mm -hmm. lead by example right there you know spend time to cultivate your own relationships with the individuals change your own reputation build your reputation with that individual like I was referring to last slide like the point of contacts may have had a bad rap or you know someone may have said something once but how do you know that's really true unless you spend time with them to to build that for yourself mm -hmm. um, and, it, and, it, and it's tough too like building and and that is the some of our, the uh, key point of our session today is because because when you know talking about reaching people who are outside like the rig workers or warehouse people, then you also have now because of the pandemic, but there's definitely a, a difference in the ability to just stop by someone's desk, hey how are you doing? You run into somebody getting a cup of coffee, three minutes but it's but it builds it builds goodwill and it builds rapport but when you try to you know now the circuit okay i have to try to find are you busy can i you know can you take a phone call can i you know can i even find your phone number like you know <laughs> can i just ping you on on teams or whatever the case might be and it's 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 hard to it's hard to do that and also to um not everybody comes off uh um it's hard to make a connection through text or yes. IM mm -hmm. yeah. or even the formality of teams. Um, I don't know for anybody who who's met me before, I'm this is definitely a little more formal for me, my my stature, my position when I'm when I'm presenting via a camera because I can't see you. So I'm I'm going blindly. I'm assuming everyone is smiling and nodding along with me too, but it's you lose that. And and right. it's really it's it's difficult, especially when you're trying to convey important messaging around compliance and around um around you know wanting people to to adopt a compliance mindset and and embrace the things that we live every single day and it's and without being able to see their the feedback you're not getting it so i you know you're just like okay gosh i hope they i hope they get it so eric i love your suggestion that or what you were commenting on that when you have new employees you go you do you work on the onboarding with them and then you go back a couple of weeks later right. and touch base with them so you are you know you're getting that facetime or 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 video time or whatever yeah, that's well, right it's, it's more of a challenge now but it can be done no, no, but that's great, though. I think that's I think that I think there's onus on on the compliance professionals even more so to to do that, to be right. like, I'm not just a person that sent you a training or wanted you to sign this thing. I am also a regular person. I care about the company. I care about you. I care about the what we're what we're trying to achieve. Um, and it's you know, sometimes you actually need to have that 
that you need to hear my voice. You need to hear the passion in my voice to right. understand that I mean that. Yeah. So sorry, to totally last, cut you off. <laughs> no worries. And then the last thing is just uh, force your way into meetings if you can. Sometimes you can't do it, but you know, I think Krista, you said this the other day, get comfortable with being uncomfortable and mm -hmm. don't beg for a seat at the table, bring your own chair. You know, sometimes we just have to force our way into it and you overhear someone and just say, hey, can I come be a fly on the wall to kind of understand what's going on to mm -hmm. just talk with people? Yeah, and I think there's been a lot of progress in that regard, um, just conversations we've had together, but also with, with <laughs> other part, members of our network is where, you know, 10 years ago, um, I think it was a lot of like the the compliance person would you know include me wait right. invite me to the meeting where instead now it's um, it's compliance professionals getting invited at the at the onset um, there's the business is seeing our value and seeing how um, seeing seeing what we all what we bring to the table so we get a seat but then the other piece of it too is is just the um, is is just that ability to of compliance being bolder mm -hmm. of not not being the the kid sister that's chasing someone saying invite me to the meeting it's just like well this is this is an important meeting and i should be here yeah and being and being bold puts some people out of their comfort zone but but you know you gotta sometimes you have to do things that make you uncomfortable right yep Okay, you want me to go on to the next one? Yeah, so here's some ideas that we have and in the chat, throw in some ways or ideas you have of ways to connect with individuals. I'm just gonna share some of the things Chris and I have done that have worked. Um, we just got another question in. I will get to that. Krista, I'm gonna read the question. Okay. And then I'll let you answer after I'm done chit, uh, talking here in a minute. Okay. So how to handle corporate ethics and compliance culture versus challenges from different countries with their culture, government styles, and ways of doing business present, present at the location corporation. So how do we handle the different ethics and compliance culture around the world, given the culture and government styles, et cetera? It's mm -hmm. good question. So, so, some of the ways that we've connected and came up with, some of them are pretty obvious, right? Tchotchkes or little gifts here and there for pins, keys or keychains, things like that, or hats with our ideas on it. One thing I've done is the, get a magnet built and send out to everyone in the organization with the company's ethics hotline on it. So if an individual wants to make a call or report something, they don't have to go look it up on the company website or afraid that they're going to um, you know, forget or someone's going to hear at the rig side or at the office and fear for retaliation. So that's one thing we've done. Another way is just use of technology articles for the company website, um, QR codes to be able to get to our policies, things like that. Compliance champions from the business, find a compliance champion in each of your locations, have them be the point of contact for you there to be your eyes and ears and a resource to the employees there. That, that, that works. You know, we've done that. We've had to do additional training for that person. They're not technically part of the compliance function, but I've given them the ability to lead by example with compliance in their location. Mm -hmm. um, compliance activities, there's trainings, there's guest articles. We've also talked about doing like lunch and learn. So there's that coffee with compliance or, you know, things like that. One thing, a couple of things that I'm gonna talk about, I'm able to be able to travel, you know, to be able to go visit our offices whenever I can. I have a budget, and my, I just stay within my budget for travel, but that's allowed me to stay engaged with those outside of the corporate walls, to take them to lunch, to take them to get coffee after hours. You know, a lot of the things I do to get employees engaged don't happen during the work hours. I take them out for dinner and I say, we're not gonna talk about lunch. I mean, we're not gonna talk about work, we're gonna talk about life because being vulnerable with them so they understand you have the real world struggles they may have it helps them understand you're always there to help and you're you're challenged just like they are in certain ways mm -hmm. and the biggest thing i've done over the past not the biggest thing but one of the unique things i've done over the past few years is i came up with a compliance rewards program for the organization we, we have a safety rewards program so if you keep someone safe 
you, you're nominated for an award for some dollar monetary amount that's approved by the CEO of the organization and they receive it. Um, that's, I love that compliance rewards because I know that you, it took you, it was a couple of years in the making or about a year right. or so just right. to, to put the proposal together to, for approval, but then, um, but you've had it in place for two years? Yes, two years, and we've given out around 20 awards. So it's not, you really have to earn it. It's just not given. And my, my, it came to discovery whenever I was measuring our company's compliance program to the federal sentencing guidelines. And in there, it talked about like components of an effective program. Well, there was one item in there, item six states that the organization's compliance and ethics program shall be promoted and enforced consistently throughout the organization with appropriate incentives in accordance with the compliance and ethics program. So what are incentives for doing the right thing in an organization? People always say that's part of your job. Well, some people go over and above, you know, on reporting things because they know it's not right. A quick example, and I know we're getting short on time here, is a rig guy reports their rig manager for doing something that could be a discriminatory or racial issue. Well, that employee is ultimately going to be feared for retaliation and lose their job or bullied on the rig site. Well, you know, they reported something that's very sensitive and um, they get rewarded for it. And feel free to reach out to me after this. Um, I can share more about it. But ultimately what happens is this individual would get a signed commendation letter by our CEO and our chief compliance officer, along with a $35 one-time coupon to the company store. It's not much, but it shows my gratitude and appreciation for them speaking up and doing the right thing from a, a compliance perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you said that the, um, the documentation that comes with it is signed by both the CEO and the CCO? CCO, yeah. Senior Vice President, Chief Legal and Chief Compliance Officer, right. Yeah, that's pretty meaningful, I would think. So good. Good, good, good. Um, okay, so do you want to address that question? Uh, first one was, for, how do you create QR codes going into a website for internal policies, for internal use for your business? Yeah. I, I would have to ask our IT department how they did that, but I know it can be done. I just yeah. asked them to say, hey, can you please help us out? Krista, do you have anything on that? Yeah, at a, um, at a prior company, we used QR codes to link to policies and that sort of thing. And it, we put that like on the digital, uh, not the digital signage, but the table toppers, that sort of thing. And we used a, uh, we used out of our budget, we bought a QR code maker. So you, you, can, you can get it, there's, you can get three, I think for free. And then if you want more than three codes linking to something else, then uh, you need a fourth code to link to something. Um, then you have to buy it. And I can't remember the price. I apologize for that. Um, but there's, there are some where you can just, you know, QR code maker, and then you can link it. The one thing is, is that if you use free software, make sure that it's okay with your IT department. So you're not doing any kind of like shadow software or agreeing to terms and conditions that you shouldn't be. You definitely don't want to run run cross to uh, some other companies or other departments policies about things like that for sure. Um, and then the other one was about culture pol drafting policies in terms of uh, when you have different cultures to consider. Yeah, how do, how do we handle corporate and ethics culture um, versus the challenges from different countries? You know, mm -hmm. for me, it's, you just have to tailor it to that organization. It's like anything else in our in our field, mm -hmm. you have to tailor to that specific location. You have to understand what you have to do there, but make the message be the same, but just tailor it in different words or in a different format so it's more meaningful to them. And that, that, that's what we've had to do is maybe change our policies, find different types of training, different examples that are mean more to them than it does to us in the US. Mm -hmm. I know um, in a, a, a prior, experience was um, at the new year in Asia PAC that um, well there's the red envelopes in China but then there's then there's just mm -hmm. Asia PAC had there's new year gifts gift giving and um, there was a there was quite a bit of of questions coming from um, some of the Asia PAC and this is not at Johnson & Johnson it's a prior company but some of the Asia PAC offices were saying well we normally get dollar we get we get at a 
when prior to being acquired, they there was a different rules around monetary gifts, uh, both for the employee and then also gifts that they could give to vendors. And it it the the solution ties back to actually what Eric was proposing for the compliance rewards is that it's non cash, um, the non cash goods. So Eric, mm -hmm. you were saying that the 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 pri uh, the reward was not was that money handed to the person who received the right. reward it was a gift certificate to use at the at the company shop right, right has a unique number and you just go in there and enter the code and get shipped to their house right so sometimes you have to get a little creative to make your um to 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 be culturally aware and sensitive, but also compliant. Um, but there are times when you also have to, as as the compliance department, you have to just say that's that's just not acceptable. That is not how we do business. I understand right. that that's I understand that that's how business could be done in this particular country, but that's not or this con particular situation. But that's not how we do it. Um, right. And that's and that's ultimately what's your company's cult, compliant culture yeah. is, you know, you yes, you you need to be aware, but not so aware that it's a, a free for all. Um, we do only have a few more minutes. I'm just going to pop over um, just over to this. Uh, we have just a few more slides. So um, one of the things that I um, want to talk about is VUCA. If you're not familiar with it, it stands for volatility uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, which um, I would say in the last couple of years, uh, I could have put a check mark after all four of those. So um, just, but volatility just is represented. So this is in terms of considering, thinking about, about VUCA in terms of what you are trying to do. You're trying to reach your employee base, trying to engage them, stay connected, um, there's a volatility is representing any kind of like sudden risks. Um, so when you're trying, so the compliance approach to employee engagement may need to be modified. The uncertainty piece of it, your employees may feel uncertain if they're lacking knowledge or awareness of an event. Um, so you want to frame your research and communication in a, appropriately to to ease that that anxiety about uncertainty. Um, when there's complexity, it's instances that are difficult to understand. So you wanna take care to properly explain as well as making yourself that trusted resource for guidance. And then the final piece, ambiguity, is really, I think it's the most challenging is because it's, it makes you feel very oogie because you don't, you don't, it's ambiguous, you don't know. Um, it can't be, it's risks that can't be anticipated. So just maintaining a strong compliance communication and leadership model is needed in those ambiguous um, situations. And let's see. Yeah. Okay. So just measuring. So back to one of the earlier questions, measuring success. Um, I really like the fail fast strategy. Um, I like how the person is actually, he's already failed, he or she has already failed and now they're running towards a better solution. Um, so strategies, knowing your strategies are working and that integration has been successful, you want to, um, you want to check that compliance is embedded in a way so that every employee is acting compliantly in their daily operations. And do your, you're measuring whether your employees know how to act when they are approaching or in, find themselves in a risky situation. You want to measure your outreach program. Is it creating a culture of honesty, integrity? Are you meeting high ethical and professional standards? And then, of course, um, some of the some of the more specific ones: Are you preventing fraud, abuse, and other compliance issues? Right. Um, in terms of measuring success, that fail fast um, for obvious reasons. There's a lot of instances in the our line of work that you don't want to fail at all, fast or otherwise. But in the context of this topic, engaging with your employees, there is some room to try different ways to see what kind of communication works with, with different folks. Now, when Eric was listing all of those different types of, of, of outreach, the tchotchkes and the hotline on the keychain and the QR codes, you can use, gauge your metrics to see how many how many hits on the with the QR code? Um, 
when you if you send out um, if you send use at a prior company we were sending out communications we were using the communications team so they were sending it out on an email platform that was gauging the metrics of how many people from the population of people who received the email how many opened the email how many clicked the links how many people right. you know you can you can track all those different um, those metrics. those different right, right. metrics. Yep. Right. And th those are some of the metrics that people were asking earlier, like what are some success metrics and right. I can hit some of them on the head. And, you know, the fell fast strategy in my mind, if something's not working, it's the next bullet point. I'm kind of stealing it from you, but pivot, make the change immediately. Yes. If, you know, if you realize that change, like the training isn't working or going as you thought it would because of whatever reasons, change it immediately. We've already, you know, we're doing our live person training this year mm -hmm. and we have already made two changes from the first session we did because it didn't go, come across as what we wanted it to come across as. So mm -hmm. be, be willing to realize something's not working and change on the fly to be able to engage employees. And we have a few comments here, questions, awesome. and we have about four minutes left. So do we want to yeah, finish it up? Yeah. So, uh, in terms of training success, we actually pitted managers. We did like a RAG status. So it was which business organization was green, yellow, and red. And um, they, the leadership teams, um, the leadership teams did not want to be orange or yellow or red. So everybody wanted to be green. So they, we just basically, uh, from a compliance perspective, we showed here's your training completion uh, metric and all the managers or the leaders, executive leadership teams of the different businesses said um, unacceptable unless I'm green. And they, we got actually 100% training completions in a, that, that year that we started instituted that, that which is amazing. I think 100% amazing. Um, okay, so Eric, just really quickly. Yep, so some of the ways the measure success and um, is just looking at hot, your hotline calls. Have they increased since communications went out, since you've had trainings? You know, we don't want hotline calls coming in, but the last call, the last session I listened to that Crystal was on, we were on the same ones. It's like, if, is are no calls showing no issues are going on compared to a district that's having lots of calls? So that's a way to measure your success. If people are calling in, that means they're paying attention to what you're asking them to do. Mm -hmm. The compliance champions, liaisons, feedback. What questions are they getting from the field versus what's coming to you? What, what are they hearing? Mm -hmm. IT policy hits, IT hits or hits on a corporate policy page. Yep. Work with your IT department to see how many people are pinging your policies page to, to you know, measures uh, engagement on there. If you see one person or there have been quite a hits lately on record retention, maybe you need to address that because that's something people are wondering more about. Right. You know, right. An example of that is we were asking for our annual certification for retention. And one of the business partners in our Tyler office asked us to come down to help out and make sure they were doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, to take example, you know, understand what's going on, you know, report what's happening in the business to others, have them talk to you. I Eric, you make a really good point. Having the business come to you organically on that retention, that I think is a fantastic measure of success because that means they, that whole team, they, they, knew, that there, they knew that there were policies and rules they needed to follow. <laughs> they, um, they wanted to do it right. And so they came right to the source and said, help us. Give us, right. give us the, you know, help us go the right direction. I mean, that's, that's like the euphoria of, of, you know, that's the euphoric state of being a compliance professional. When you have somebody come to you just out of the blue and say, I need you to help me rather right. than always having to push in. That's fantastic news for you. Yeah. Your program. Um, yeah. It's been a lot, a lot of time to get them engaged. We're about a minute away and I have not got to all the questions. One of the questions was, um, to hear more about the rewards program I put in place, just reach out to me. My communications will be there. Yeah. Um, Kristen, you, the QR, I'm sure there was QR metrics for that of how many people were pinging it. So that is, mm -hmm. and then, you, you know, know what we could do too. Um, and I think Alyssa might be listening also the ECI folks, they may be able to give us the questions and we can, we can try to answer those in like an right. FAQ that we can add at the, at the end of this, um, this training deck before yeah, we uh, post it up line. 
because right. I know everybody's so, probably want to, it's the end of the day for some folks, right? Right. And it's, so. you know, you know, there's no right or wrong method. Yeah. It's figuring out what's most important to keep them engaged and make changes if it isn't working. That, that's the things we want to put out there and feel free to reach out to Krista or I. We, we're on LinkedIn. We're always happy to have this conversation either in person and from the same area or get on a call together. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for your time and for your engagement. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of the questions, but like I said, Eric and I'll connect and, and um, try to answer as many as we can uh, via electronically or at the end of this at the end of this deck. Really yep. appreciate it. Have a great, wonderful rest of your day and um, happy birthday, Eric. Uh, that's tomorrow, but thank you. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.